sometimes when we gather, we, you know, it's about a lot of things. It can be about a lot of things. It can be about, oh, who's going who's gonna to share the, the coolest new revelation that we have? You know, the reality is there isn't anything new. Um, it's living it out. That's the new part. It, it comes as a revelation to us when finally the light goes off on the inside. You go, oh, oh, that's what God's been trying to say to me, right? But it isn't really new. I mean, there's been you know, thousands of years of people following God, and God's been speaking to them. And, you know, you got to be a little weird or leery when someone says, oh, I've got this great new revelation. You know, you got to hear it. It's like, uh, well, okay, I'd love to hear it. I'm not sure how much it's a new revelation. Now, when I say that, there is a new application sometimes to Revelation. So um, we might learn how to uh, exercise certain things that God's given to us in a, a new situation in our life. So that's new in that sense. But the, the revelation of Scripture, the common salvation, the simple gospel has been around for a long time. So um, you either have heard it and are aware of it or you haven't. But um, So we don't come here today to try to compete in the sense of some new message or something that's going to be, oh, uh, oh, I never heard that before. But we come here to talk about living it out, living it out, that Christian experience in a way that is meaningful to us and uh, 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 meaningful to God as well. So I'm going to start from James chapter 1, if you have your Bibles. If not, I'm going to read it so it won't really matter. Uh, you can take notes if you want, and then you can go home and make sure that what I told you was what it says and not make up some kind of wild thing. Um, we're going to be talking about joy today, and the reason we're going to be talking about joy today is because sometimes we have this idea that joy is about our life being um, our life being new or something. And it's not about it being new. It's about uh, it's about again, like we talked about that revelation of going on. So in James chapter one, uh, starting at verse one, James is writing. It says, "James, the letter is coming from James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting." So he's sending out this letter to uh, these particular people that are scattered abroad. It applies to us. We are followers of God, so it's, it's to us as well. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. What? What? What happens when you fall into temptation? Anybody here have some experiences? And, you know. So what happens to us is well, we are tempted... And then in that temptation, we do one of two things. Either we bemoan the fact that this is something that has a hold on us that God doesn't want us to do, and so we go into that uh, grieving kind of thing. Oh, I'm not allowed, you know, God doesn't want me to do that anymore. He wants, you know, so I've got to give it up. And it's that struggle of giving up this thing, this weight that we carry. Or, uh, worse, we yield to the temptation. And here he says to us, what we're supposed to do is, Brother, when, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Um, I always, I'm a little leery, someone will come up to you after the service and say, Pastor, would you pray for me that I would have patience? And you say, you really want me to do that? And I go, yeah. I said, well, you know what the Bible says? And they say, well, no, what does it say? It says that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So if you want me to pray for you to have patience, I need to pray for you that your faith would be tried. Is that what you really want? Well, if you really want patience, it is what you really want, right? That's the whole point. But, but it isn't what we think of. We just think that somehow, like a magic wand, when we pray, it's all going to change. Well, yes, it's going to change, but there's a process in that change, right? Because it's, the biggest struggle to change is us, Right? I mean, God, God doesn't have a problem. God's perfect. So for us to change and come in line with God, it's the us part that has to change. So it's the dying to self. And so it says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And it's about having our eyes open and seeing all of a sudden that, that what's really happening around about us isn't just about some desire you have. It's about how that in those desires, God wants to show you that you can be transformed by his power, that those things no longer have a hold on you. And recognizing that, then it creates within us this joy about, um, you know, how, oh, this is hard, but man, God's doing a work in me. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, 
For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we come before God and we say, God, you know, this is hard. Give me your wisdom. Give me your wisdom. And then what are we going to do? We have to believe by faith that God heard our prayer and has answered our prayer and is going to, as the need arises, give us the wisdom in the situation to do what is right. And in that process, of course, we continue to study the Word. We continue to worship God in spirit and truth. We continue to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. All that's part of that. Right? It's all part of that experience. And so that's why when we gather here, that's what he's talking about. Now, in, 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 the, Old or in the New Testament, in the beginning, in the, in the um, parables, Jesus told many things about the kingdom of God and things like that. But one of the parables, just one verse, it says, Matthew 13, 44 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden in a field. A treasure. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. Now, what's cool about that is, obviously, if everybody knew the treasure was there and valued it as treasure, they would all go and get it, wouldn't they? But the reality is, we know that that isn't the way it is. The kingdom of God often is something that is unseen. The kingdom of heaven is something that's unseen, untapped into, ungrasped after. The Bible says we're supposed to lay hold on eternal life. It's something we're supposed to grab a hold of and hang on. And so it says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden in a field that when a, which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goes and sells all that he hath and buyeth that field. Now, there's a lot just in that little, that little parable. Because it talks about about the revelation of finding it. And that's about the desire to, to, to possess it. Right? So first he finds it. It says, which, when a man hath found, he hides it, and for joy thereof goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Right? So there's the revelation of it, the desire to possess it, which brings joy. Right? There's that joy again. And for joy. Right? Because it's like, I, wow, I finally found what I'm looking for, right? Not like um, the musician who keeps singing, that guy that, you know, he's been all around and he sings, and I still haven't found what I'm looking for, right? He hasn't found what he's looking for. Like, and he talks about, well, I've talked with the tongues of angels, you know, like, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Um, and, 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 and we've talked about that. Forever searching, forever studying, forever doing all those things, and never ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That, that's a lot of people like that. They keep looking, but they, never, they don't see it for some reason. They just don't see it. But here it says, he finds it, he sees it, and for joy thereof he goes, and then at th that part, and sells all that he has. How much does the treasure in the field cost? How much you got? That's what it costs. Whatever. All that you have. No, but do you understand what I'm saying? That's what it costs. And, and I don't mean that there isn't a price tag attached to it. It's just that possessing this thing will cost you everything. But it's interesting to notice that the guy was filled with joy that that wasn't, that wasn't an obstacle to obtaining it. Because of the joy in having it or, or, or seeing it for what it was and wanting to possess it, he was willing to sell all that he had that he might possess that field. In 1 John chapter 1, that's the epistle of John chapter 1, it says, verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifest unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy might be full. We lived in uh, the town of Dundas when we, right after we got married, uh, my wife and I, we have moved into Hamilton, but our, our goal, our desire was to live in Dundas. And so after a few years, we moved in back to Dundas where I had gone to high school. That's where we went. And we went to 
went there to pioneer a church to the, um, in the community. And we sort of had this standing joke that you could tell who in town was a Christian and who wasn't because if they were miserable when he went into the store, they were probably a Christian. Right? And sure enough, we'd go into a store and there'd be a grouchy person in there and, and you'd say, oh, tell me, you know, you could talk to them and they'd start telling me, oh yeah, we go to such and such a church and they're thinking like me. Like, what's the problem with that? What, what, and of course, it's connected to the fact that we have an enemy who, who recognizes that if we uh, walk in the revelation of who God is and what he wants to do in us, we would be filled with joy. And our joy would be infectious, right? It would be infectious. And so people would be saying, well, tell me, you know, like if, if we were dynamic and excited about what we have, it wouldn't be this big struggle about getting people to listen to what we have to say because they would be saying to you, hey, you know, tell me why you think or tell me why you live the way you live. But instead, our enemy works really hard to get us our mindset off of that. The goal is to get us preoccupied with problems or difficulties or challenges. That's why when we started, it said, my brother encountered all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. The enemy wants you to be all discouraged when you fall into diverse temptations. He wants you to be worried. He wants you to be filled with gloom and doom. He wants you to be unhappy because then as you go out into the world, that is your testimony. How often have you heard someone say, you know, you know, God wants to set you free just like me. And they go, what you got is what you're going to get. I don't want it. Right? Because we're uptight. We're negative. We're, and, and that's not what it was. You know, the amazing thing about Jesus is Jesus went around doing the will of the Father. He, he wasn't, he, he, he um, it wasn't about whether the people wanted him to or not wanted to. It wasn't about the religious leaders and their opposition. Jesus just did with eager anticipation the will of the Father. And so out of that, God wanted to do a work, and he wants to do the same work in us, right? He wants to do that same work in us. So um, if you're in the world, if you're thinking like you're in the world, you're saying to yourself, why do I have this job? I think I should have a better job, right? That's how, that's how people in the world think. Why am I the one that's the bus boy at the restaurant? Why can't I be, you know, uh, own some business or be a movie star or something like that, right? That's how the world... So everybody's always self-centered. God's always thinking about um, putting us where we are of best use for him in the kingdom. Right? So, so God gets you a job as a garbage man. Are you depressed about every bucket of garbage you pick up and throw in the truck? Or are you saying, praise God for this opportunity. Hi, Mrs. Jones. It's good to see you this morning. How are you? Do you understand what I'm saying? It, we, seeing that job as a manifestation and an extension of the kingdom of God... Is what it's all about. But if we don't see that, then we're just out there being a garbage man. Right? And if we're just out there being a garbage man, then we're saying, God, where's your blessing? And God says, well, you got the money for the work that you did, so you got all that you got. You're saying, no, but I want, I want what you have for me as a son of God. Well, then you start, have to start manifesting and living like the Son of God. You have to start speaking to circumstances and mountains and, and getting them to move. You have to start manifesting a belief system that believes God's in control. Right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean up on your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. We have, trusting God means that when difficulties come, when you're driving down the street and you get a flat tire, it's not, uh, 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 it's, you get out of your car and you look at it and say, well, God, what is it you want to do today? What are we going to do in this circumstance? Do you want me to lay my hands on the tire and have it be restored? Do you want me to uh, witness to the tow truck driver? Is there someone in the neighborhood who you want to bring out here to help me that I might be like Jesus at the well situation where in their attempt to help me, I might be helping them with the message of the gospel of Christ? And, we have, and that's a whole mindset. We have, that has to be the way we begin to live every day. Right? My mom called me. My mom's 91 and a, a typical older person in the sense that she's not into technology and not into anything like that. I do a lot of her banking for her because, you know, the bank card and stuff like that. Anyway, um, yesterday I was with her and she said, um, take out so much money from my bank because I'm going with you to get a few things at the store. But tomorrow I'm going, I have a worker coming in tomorrow because she got hit by a car and they, they broke her leg and they had to put a 
brought in. So now um, the insurance settlement had a whole bunch of things because um, some guy made an illegal turn and hit her. And so the insurance company is, you know, we're going to give you a worker to help you. So anyway, so she said to me, well, I'm going to go get groceries. I said, well, mom, do you have enough money? She said, well, yeah, I got enough money. I said, well, here's what I want you to understand. You know this bank card that you have, if you get to the checkout at the grocery store and you don't have enough money on you, you can put that card in just like you do at the bank, and then you can punch in your code and it will take the money right out of your bank, right into the grocery store, and you'll be good. So sure enough, yesterday, the first time, she goes with this worker. She gets up to the checkout and she said, I really felt God was telling me to buy this thing that I was there. And when I got to the checkout, though, Instead of having enough money, I was $6 short. And she said, then I remember that you said to me yesterday that I could use my bank card. So she called me. She said, I just want you to know, that was obviously the leading of God because how, you know, just the day before, just in time for me to do that and be able, and, and, and so that's what I'm telling you is in our lives, it may seem like insignificant things, but God wants us to be that source of uh, encouragement and direction, and you know, sometimes we think, well, I'm going to be a prophet of God. Okay, well, maybe you are. But we have this idea that a prophet of God is going to be standing up on a stage somewhere speaking these great, eloquent words of prophetic utterance. And often it's, it's meeting with your neighbor over the backyard gate, and you speak something from God that is a prophetic word into their life, and you and they both don't know it at the time, and it's not until later that you realize that was the word of God spoken into their life. But we have to begin to, to see that, that we have this passion to, uh, in, in all the circumstances of life, to see that God wants to do something. Something amazing. You know, when Jesus was walking all those dusty roads through Nazareth and that, I don't think it was the uh, glamorized version of the life of Jesus we think it was. You know, that it was all, they were all skipping down the street, and, you know, the, the flowers were blooming as they walked by, you know, and the birds were on Jesus' shoulder chirping and stuff, and like, you know, kind of like some Hollywood movie. It wasn't like that. It was, it was the tediousness of the same life that you live. Jesus got to the well in Samaria, and it says that he was tired. He was tired. He had walked a long way. He told his disciples, I must needs go to Samaria. But he didn't allow the tiredness of the physical body to affect the outcome of what, what God wanted to do. And so in that diverse temptation where he was probably tempted to say, I'm just going to lay down here and go to sleep. He didn't. And the disciples went off, as you know, to seek after food. And Jesus stayed and ministered to the woman at the well. Great story. You need to read it. your joy might be full. 1 Peter 1 to verse 6 says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, and though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's the work God's doing in us. Whom having not seen you love, and whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. God's doing a work in us, and, and it's uh, little steps that take place every day in our life. As we get up in the morning, we say, praise God, I'm tired, but God, I know you have something great for me to do. And so I get out of bed, and by faith I go forward, and I'm, you know, <laughs> making my way down the hall to the bathroom, to wash your face or whatever. But believing that God wants to do something amazing. And so we're filled with joy and anticipation knowing that in spite of the, the frailties of our humanness as we get older, that becomes more evident. But in spite of that, we are believing that God in all the circumstances of life has amazing things to do, whether it's um, witnessing to a neighbor, whether it's writing a new worship song, whether it's just offering up praise and thanksgiving, whether it's just praying as you're driving on your way to work, praying through all the names and faces of people that God brings to you in, in their situation, speaking uh, the will and purpose of God over their life, right? All of that goes into people being changed. It's not just, uh, you know, one little thing. It's all of that. 
And then, of course, we know in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about um, fruit. Now, how many people know the difference between gifts and fruit? Where do gifts come from? Yeah, the Bible says every good gift comes from above. God gives it to you. So there you are, whatever, on your birthday, Christmas, whatever you celebrate, it doesn't matter. Um, but you know what? You get a gift. You didn't have to do anything to get it. All you had to do was open the package. It's yours. It's given to you. Not, not, it's, it's without. So when you get a gift, sometimes people say, wow, you have an amazing gift. That must make you spiritual. No, gifts don't make you spiritual. Gifts are things that are given to you. They have nothing to do with spirituality. That's God chooses to give to who God chooses. Fruit, on the other hand, is how does it come to us? Fruit is developed in us. Right? Someone said to me, well, you know, sometimes I, I don't see much fruit of God in some people. I said, well, have you, have you ever grown a fruit tree in your yard? And they go, well, yeah. I said, well, how many years did it take for that fruit tree to develop fruit? I said, well, sometimes it takes five, six years. I said, okay, so was it not a fruit tree when you planted it? It was, but it didn't manifest the fruit right away because it had to develop in it. Did you know if we don't get winters, we cannot have apples? We have to have frost. Apple trees will not bear fruit, apples, if there is no frost. It's just the way it is. That's why you can't grow apples in Florida. Mind you, you can't grow oranges in Ontario either, but that's just the way that is. And so... There are things that are necessary for fruit to be developed in us. And so it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's Galatians 5.16. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these... Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulsions, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as, all, uh, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, and if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. Now, the fruit of the Spirit are these other attributes. And so they, they are the evidence of yielding to the Spirit of God in our life. 